Hello everyone and welcome to another News Coulomb video. So if you follow this channel, you know I just did a plug side chat about what it means to be a public charging provider or a national public charging provider, just providing a sort of definition and metric to that. So this plug side chat is sort of an addendum to that because one of the things that I also think that we need to define with public charging providers is almost like the levels of autonomy for uh, self-driving or self-assisted driving features in cars. I think we should probably assign levels to the different charging providers to define exactly what kind of a charging provider they are because I think it also feeds into issues of reliability, not necessarily on the charger by charger level, but sort of on the network level so it's more of a question of how much can you count on this particular charging provider to stick around, to be available, to be, uh, like I said, sort of reliable more on the macro sense than on the sort of charger specific sense. Because I think this will feed into that a bit and I'll tie it into some of these other discussions that I've had in the past about disappearing chargers and things of that nature. So... A level one charging provider, so starting at that very base level, I think you can refer that to charging providers who really only offer the billing and connectivity services, right? So this would be something along the lines of what ChargePoint was sort of doing originally. Blink does a lot of this as well, where they're somewhat hardware agnostic but they will come in and they'll provide the billing service and they'll allow you to connect to your customers they'll provide a network and billing and payment uh, but they're not really responsible for the hardware in the sense that they want the host to buy the hardware and most of the time pay for the maintenance of that hardware and the upkeep of that hardware pay for the power that's being fed through that uh, and this is where we see a lot of these uh charging implementations fail when the site host is having to pay for the power then they realize that their demand charges go through the roof and they're just really not seeing the traffic uh, to make it worth it for them uh, to sell power so it ends up costing them more than what they're actually making in order to provide this essentially public service so this is that sort of first level, level one. All it is is a software and connectivity. A lot of times you still see this right now connected to level two charging rather than DC fast charging uh, because that's really what I think a lot of people are looking for in terms of site hosts or businesses or cities where they're putting in chargers and they say, well, we want to at least recoup some cost. So how do we bill our customers? It's it's that sort of level of charging provider status that's applying to that, that level one. So above that is the level two. And this is probably the most common. And that's where charging providers are providing a turnkey solution in terms of it's both the software and the hardware. They're planning the site, they're installing the hardware, they're upkeeping the hardware, they're maintaining all of it, maintaining the billing, paying the power bill. So this is, like I said, probably this level two is probably the most common that we're seeing right now. And that really is like the Electrify Americas, the EV goes, or the Shell Recharges. And so what they do is they make it easy for the site host. They sign a lease agreement, they come in, they install the chargers, and they manage the software, they manage the connectivity, they maintain or hopefully maintain the chargers uh, and keep them in a good running condition. And so what you'll see too as we go up these levels is this level two is really built on that level one. At a bare minimum, you know, they're still doing all of those uh, those other things. So a level two charging provider is also managing the billing and connectivity. But in addition to that, they're now providing the hardware, they're managing the hardware, they're upkeeping the hardware, and they're paying the power bill. So now a level three charging provider is just a minor step and it's a subtle but I think important distinction. And that's a charging provider that is building their own hardware and their own equipment. 
And with that, you have the now charge point, you have Tesla, where what they're doing is they're building all of their chargers in-house and Rivian uh, is doing this as well. So they're not only doing all of those other things, the level one, providing the software and billing and connectivity, level two, paying for the power, the site design, installing the hardware, but three, they're actually also creating their own hardware. And the reason this is so important is because it speaks to maintenance, it speaks to reliability, it speaks to interoperability. It means that this charging provider is better able to maintain their sites, upkeep them, ensure functionality. Uh, and so it's really important. And it's probably, in my opinion, one of the areas where EVgo as a charging provider is most at risk. And maybe Electrify America, I mean, they have a deal now with BTC Power and Signet, but they're still at the mercy of those companies. And a lot of times we see this too with supply chains. When ChargePoint was having difficulty upkeeping their Tritium charging sites, it was because they probably couldn't get parts from Tritium right you know you have this australian charging provider who's not building chargers in the united states and their rt50 you know v fill chargers just weren't that reliable and when they went down charge point is scrambling to try to find parts to repair them and it's just difficult to do but now that charge point is making their cpe 250 chargers those are something that they're building in-house it's much easier for them to repair maintain, upkeep those chargers. It's one of the reasons why Tesla is doing so well in upkeeping their sites and maintaining them is they build everything in house. Uh, and so they don't rely on anyone outside of the company. This is that vertical integration idea. They don't rely on anybody outside of that company for their hardware and for their maintenance. So they can do it all themselves. And it gives these level three charging providers a huge advantage over the level two charging providers. And then there's one more level though that, and, and maybe there'll be a fifth level that we'd have to define at some time in the future, but this level four I think is super important. It's rarely done. Uh, and I think it's going to have a huge impact on how we see these different charging providers. And that level four charging provider does all of those other things that I was talking about but they also own the site itself. And the reason that's important is lease agreements. And I mentioned it in a previous video where we're seeing things like charge point sites being taken offline. We're seeing EVgo sites being taken offline. And why is that? It's because their lease is up. And at some point, we're going to start seeing this with Tesla supercharging sites. We're going to see it with Electrify America charging sites. As those leases end, as properties get sold, go to new property managers, things of that nature, those charging sites are at risk of being closed. And that's a huge amount of capital and a huge investment into a service that's going to eventually just go away. And that's a problem. And so anybody that's a level four charging provider is going through the trouble of buying their own property. And we have a few examples of this. And one of one of the best in the United States anyway is Kettleman City, where Tesla actually bought a property and built their chargers on it. So no lease agreements, nothing of that nature. They own it, it's their property. And so as long as Tesla stays in business, that charging site should stay operational. And that's a huge advantage as we start to see, you know, like I said, the land landscape, forgive the pun, start to shift and lease ag agreements end and properties change hands. The new host doesn't want to host that charging provider, whatever. This takes a huge risk out of that. And it means that these chargers are now being placed in a location that as EV owners, we can count on them being there into the future. So that level four charging provider status is going to be a really important benchmark for some of these charging providers to be reaching for and striving for because it can't just be about 
living off of someone else's lease and trusting that that lease continues to be renewed, uh, that the property doesn't change hands, that sort of thing. Because like I said, we're, we've already seen it and we're starting to see it more and more. That level four standard is, is going to be, I think, where we're going to want to see some of these national charging providers head, at least for a good percentage of their sites. And it also speaks just to the success of them as a business, right? We talk about when are these charging providers going to be turning profits? When are they going to be a major company? Companies like public storage, companies like McDonald's, people misconstrue them as storage companies or in the case of McDonald's, a fast food restaurant. They're not. They're real estate companies. They own the real estate and that's what makes them successful. And so when you own the land that you're operating on, it gives you a massive advantage over everybody else who's competing against you in that space. You literally own every aspect of what's operating on your chargers. And in the case of something like Tesla, I think they made a ma major mistake with their Kettleman City site in the sense that they tried to maintain that as their own lounge. You can lease out sections of your property to businesses build it to spec you can bring in a uh, mcdonald's or an in and out or some other company that wants to operate and lease out of that building that's co-located with your chargers it's a huge opportunity for these charging providers and one that hasn't really been tapped into yet uh, but it's a direction that i see us going in the future Anyway, I'd love to hear what you think. What do you think about defining these different levels of charging providers and what it means to be each one of these levels and how important it is for these charging providers to move away from just being basic billing, basic installation to actually owning their own hardware, making their own hardware, and then even owning their own public charging sites. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And thank you for watching.